Welcome along, ladies and gentlemen, to uh, your weekly SETI seminar series. Uh, today we're uh, lucky enough to be joined by uh, a new SETI PI, Dan Lubin. Uh, Dan uh, got a uh, BA in physics from Northwestern, and then uh, two masters in geophysics and uh, astronomy, and, uh, ast uh, and astronomy from uh, University of Chicago, and then a PhD in geophysics from University of Chicago. And uh, then uh, he uh, developed an interest in uh, polar uh, research. He's been to uh, Antarctica three times and uh, to the Arctic three times. He's written uh, a book with a colleague in 2006, a two-volume polar remote sensing uh, book. Uh, it looks very interesting, although I haven't uh, got through it uh, all yet. Um, uh, Dan's a uh, person who's worked with uh, looking at uh, climate change uh, and how it relates to uh, the, the uh, poles of the Earth. Today he's going to talk to us about uh, the Maunder Minimum and uh, his research uh, into uh, the polar, research, uh, polar, polar regions of the Earth. So if you'll join me in welcoming Dan. Okay. Uh, thanks, Adrian. Um, uh, as Adrian mentioned, I've been... Uh, visiting SETI for about four months now and I've enjoyed meeting various people and uh, it's, it's a wonderful organization that uh, th that you have here at, you know very fascinating is interdisciplinary work a lot like Scripps which is my home institution um, I, I think my, my mission as a climate researcher somewhat overlaps with your mission uh, you, you guys are interested in hopefully eventually finding signs of life or even intelligent life somewhere out there in the cosmos my interest is is in our own species uh, surviving long enough to uh, eventually uh, find other life and, and that involves uh, understanding how we might be uh, affecting our climate with our industrial activities. Um, and I think it's important uh, always to think outside the box and, and consider everything that can affect the, the, uh, the Earth's climate and its variability, not only our, our uh, emissions of greenhouse gases but also solar variability and all of this has to be placed in context and so what I'm going to talk about um, is a, a new program that uh, I'm starting with various colleagues uh, at Scripps uh, Climate Modelers and also uh, uh, David Teitler and, and uh, Dave Kirkman in uh, the UCSD's uh, physics department or Center for Astrophysics and Space Science we're trying to, to uh, work on the Maunder minimum uh, problem from you know from both sides and uh, so what is the Maunder Minimum? Well, I'll just back up. Uh, it's a, the Maunder Minimum is a fun topic because if you like history, you know, this is basically science and the engine of three musketeers. Um, the, the, the dawn of modern physics was also an important milestone for, uh, for climate and geophysical research. And once uh, various tools such as thermometers and telescopic imaging of sunspots uh, became available, uh, scientists, uh, who were very, a very lonely species back then, just began using them and keeping records and those records are, are quite useful. And uh, we're particularly lucky that um, uh, telescopic observations of sunspots began in the early 17th century, uh, such that uh, there was a record of, um, of some, some, some sunspot activity at the beginning. And then uh, as they began to keep track of this, uh, they, there were several decades that went by, about maybe you know, five solar, normal solar cycle periods, where there were just very, basically no sunspots, or very few. And uh, then that increased a bit uh, until um, sort of, sort of a, max, a local maximum at the end of the 18th century, and then there was another minimum in sunspot activity um, uh, during the early 19th century, followed by a steady rise to the present day uh, maximum. And uh, we identify these periods as the Maunder minimum, the deepest of these, and the, uh, then there was the Dalton minimum that occurred uh, at the beginning of the 1800s. So what, what is the impact of this, this change in solar activity that's quite significant? There's, as I said, we're going through, uh, you're looking at this problem from, from both perspectives. The, the geophysical questions involve uh, how, do we, um, how do we interpret this type of solar activity or grand minimum in terms of climate variability, and in particular in the context of anthropogenic warming. Uh, 
if the sun were to go into a, a maunder minimum into in the future, would this offset the climate warming that we're, uh, we're now attributing to CO2 and other greenhouse gas increases? Um, the astrophysical questions include, uh, can we use analogs uh, of the sun, solar type stars or even solar twins, to estimate how frequently this maunder minimum type event occurs? There are proxies in our own climate record that can take us back before instrumental records and, and give us an estimate of, of maybe how, how often uh, and how deeply the sun varied, but uh, if we can use uh, solar analogs uh, in a comprehensive way, we might get a better handle on the, uh, you know, first the frequency and then hopefully eventually the mechanism by which the, uh, this, the, the sun and, and, and similar stars go into these, uh, these grand minima. And so, uh, so we start with what's going on. Um, we know that sunspots, of course, rec um, uh, related to magnetic activity, and there are various proxies uh, for the solar cycle that we can then use to reconstruct the irradiance variability. Uh, there's the 10.7 uh, the centimeter uh, coronal radio, uh, radio flux, uh, there's magnesium and calcium chromospheric activity measures, and of course the sunspot number itself. Uh, more sunspots are in, uh, indicate more magnetic activity and then there are these various uh, observations we can make. Uh, Judith Lean at the Naval Research Lab has uh, been one of the leaders in this area uh, using uh, facular brightening, as was one of her methods, to, uh, to reconstruct the solar irradiance uh, or th since the, uh, the Maunder Minimum and even before, going back to when we first have sunspot records. And um, her estimate is about, uh, about a two point, a little bit over two watts per square meter difference in the total solar irradiance between the, the core of the Maunder minimum and today's uh, solar maximum. Uh, doesn't sound like much, but climatically it, it is quite significant. Um, and as I mentioned, there are, there are other geological proxies um, and also biological proxies of, um, of solar variability uh, in our own records. Uh, beryllium 10 and carbon 14 uh, beryllium 10 and ice cores and carbon 14 and things like tree rings, uh, they're influenced by cosmic rays and then so therefore they, they, for, they therefore track solar variability. Um, and those are very helpful. Uh, and now the, the actual, we, we know from numerous historical records that the, um, the, the, the climatic impact of the Monte Minimum was huge. Uh, the, 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 the Monte Minimum period, roughly 1645 to 1715, was um, the core of uh, what's known as the Little Ice Age, um, where there were several of these minima in solar activities, in solar activity, uh, the, the Thames was frozen no, most winters, sometimes for as long as two months, and then these, this little institution of frost fairs that uh, took place on the Thames in, in England. Um, th this, this lower picture here is uh, an example of just how uh, uh, climate change is actually a national security issue even today. This depicts the, uh, the Swedish army crossing the frozen Baltic. The Baltic regularly froze in, in places uh, um, quite extensively in the 17th century. And in, in, in this war between uh, the Danes and the Swedes, the Swedes marched their army across the frozen Baltic and attacked Copenhagen and won the war. Um, I think sort of the opposite is happening today with uh, the Arctic sea ice uh, retreating. Uh, in response to climate warming, that's changing some strategic considerations. Uh, all of a sudden there's a lot more it's easy access to oil up in the Arctic. Uh, the Northwest Passage is now open and ca Canada is beginning to feel its oats. Russia is certainly going to take advantage of whatever they can in terms of a more open Arctic and, and oil exploration. So uh, um, climate change has uh, you know, national security issues uh, when, wherever you look at it. Um, there, it turns out the, uh, that there are enough proxy records um, that we can reconstruct the climate going back to about that period, 1600 or so. Uh, as you go back further and further in time, there are fewer proxy records, and then it's harder and harder to reconstruct temperature trends, especially regional temperature trends. But you notice here from this diagram, uh, which shows the, uh, the types of proxy records in, of climate that are available and how far back they go in time, 1600 and onward, there's, there's quite a bit of, uh, of data from various, uh, you know, various biological and, and ge uh, geological markers, and um, they give you some clues as to regional variability, and that's, that's very useful for understanding the Maunder Minimum. Um, reconstructing the Northern Hemisphere temperature, um, we see here that when you use all of these, these diagnostic, um, these proxies, 
uh, especially in the lower panel. This, this period we call the Little Ice Age, roughly 1350, where you see the first little dip all the way to, uh, to 1800 or so, or, or a little beyond. That sticks out uh, easily at the 95% confidence level, especially as uh, there are more data and, uh, and, and smaller error bars from this period as opposed to earlier periods. So we do know the climate was considerably cooler during the Maunder minimum. And we can assess the regional variability as well. So what we want to do is try to understand the mechanisms by which that happened. Obviously, the solar irradiance dropped by some amount. And there's, there's still controversy about how much the solar irradiance did drop. Uh, Judith Lean came up with a number of around 2 watts per square meter. Other people have uh, come up with smaller estimates based on different proxies for the, the, the relationship between sunspot number and, uh, and solar luminosity. Um, so it's, it's uncertain whether the, you know, I think the estimates currently range from about a half a watt to, uh, you know, two and a half watts in terms of the, uh, the solar radiance drop. But uh, we can use climate modeling to help assess which of those numbers is more realistic. And we can also just understand what, you know, what went on when the solar radiance decreased. Um, th this, um, this figure I always like to show in, in as many talks as I can, just to clarify uh, the sophistication uh, of, uh, of a global climate model. These are one of the main, main, uh, or major tools we use in the geophysical sciences. Uh, unfortunately, I think all scientists tend to shoot ourselves in the foot with the language we use sometimes. So when we talk about the, the theory of evolution, you know, it's, it's the basic law of the life sciences. And we, we talk about climate models somewhat modestly as models. Well, a model can mean various things to m different people. You know, a, uh, an economist or a psychologist or something you know, might consider a model as something you draw on the back of, a, of an envelope or the back of a napkin. Well, the climate, when, I, when people ask me what is a global climate model, I, I, the analogy I make is uh, think of a Boeing 777. Have you ever flown on a Boeing 777? Back in the early 1990s, computers were getting powerful enough uh, um, that they could design an entire airplane and certify it from scratch. And the Boeing 777 was the first airplane that was designed and certified mainly by computer simulation. At that same time, the climate models were beginning to incorporate uh, a wide variety of, of real physics in the Earth's atmosphere system and, and become more accurate and, and more robust. Uh, one example, uh, and this is something you, you, if you ever look at these, some of these climate skeptic kind of websites, you often see disinformation in, in the form of stuff that's been out there for many, many years and has since been disproven, but it's still it's kind of out there on the internet. Um, one common thing that you will still see um, is this business of the, the temperature trend um, across the, the beginning of the industrial age to the present and there was a sort of gradual warming across this period, but then there was a, a, a flattening of the, temp the uh, temperature record in the 1940s. And many of the earliest climate model simulations could not simulate this flattening. They just, as you increase the greenhouse, effect, uh, greenhouse gases in the model, there was just a steady increase, and people would say, well, you can't reproduce this, therefore the models aren't worth very much. Um, it turns out when you include in the models realistic predictions of industrial emission and the, uh, the aerosols, the, the, the sulfates and the black carbon from, uh, from industrial emission that kind of peaked in the 1940s and 1950s that induced a cooling which, did, which tended to flatten off the global temperature trends for a while uh, until industry became a little bit cleaner and then um, that, that the impact of the aerosols in the troposphere uh, diminished and then the, uh, the Earth's climate warmed yet again. And so this is just one example of uh, when, when you put the, uh, the, the sophisticated physics in the climate model, they do reproduce what's, got, what's in the temperature records quite well. So turning to the, uh, the Maunder Minimum, some of the, the first people to look at it with climate models were the folks at NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies. And um, here we have, uh, at the top, we have a proxy data reconstruction. I believe this is from, uh, from Michael Mann's work. Um, where they've taken all of these proxies that I showed a few slides ago and de derived the regional, the regional temperature difference um, in the northern hemisphere from the core of the Maunder minimum around 1660 versus the, the uh, subsequent maximum, pre-industrial maximum around 1780. And then using a, a, a GCM, uh, the, 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 the uh, NASA GIST climate model, they, they, get a, they made a uh, a fairly uh, respectable simulation of this regional climate variability, at least the, the, this regional surface air temperature <coughs> variability. 
Um, just to, here's another, uh, another slide just showing the, uh, the northern hemisphere mean surface temperature um, in ensembles of uh, climate model runs compared with the, uh, the proxy temperature records. And uh, there's a, there's a, a fairly good uh, mapping of the, um, the climate model simulations with the, um, with the reconstructions, including when volcanic emissions are taken into account um, in the climate model simulation. Uh, there, there's some people who, who argue that, um, that be because things like the Maunder minimum happen, the sun is so variable um, and has such a variable impact on the climate on century timescales and so forth, that a lot of these climate model predictions we're making about warming throughout the next century don't really don't have any value. I think the people who try to make that argument actually have it backwards in the sense that um, uh, because our climate models can do such a good job of explaining the proxy reconstructions uh, as best we know them, I think that that indicates that they are valuable predictive tools for forecasting what's going to happen if we don't uh, stop putting uh, excess greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So one thing we, we asked uh, using a climate model simulation is what, what if the sun were just to go into a maunder minimum state tomorrow? Uh, what would happen? Would it offset the global warming that we, we know we're already... Uh, we're already producing, and uh, even if we were to stabilize the CO2 levels right now, we would still be committed to a certain amount of warming, but of course that's not going to happen. Um, so the questions we want to ask are, uh, supposing we uh, imagine the, uh, the IPCC uh, Intergover Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change B1 scenario. That's the most optimistic of the scenarios, where, pe where the IPCC has just estimated industrial emissions uh, and uh, forecast what the loading of CO2 would be in the atmosphere throughout the century. And the B1 scenario is where the CO2 uh, is stabilized at 550 parts per million. Um, not quite double uh, the pre-industrial, but, but a fairly heavy loading. But that's the most, uh, that's the most optimistic of the scenarios, where they've uh, imagined that leading industrial nations um, put some tight controls on emissions. So imagine, OK, so we, we decide to let's simulate this uh, B1 scenario, say, 50 years into the future. What happens if we decrease the solar irradiance analogous to the Maunder minimum? Does that offset the climate warming? And so what we're going to use is uh, the National Center for Atmospheric Research uh, climate model, one version of it that has a fairly simplified ocean model, but it is coupled to an ocean, so it, it has realistic physics. Um, one key fa uh, aspect of this model is its climate sensitivity is somewhat less than that of the, uh, the NASA Goddard Institute models. Um, and so that's kind of a test on the robustness of the results. Uh, the climate sensitivity is just uh, a measure of what happens to the global, global temperature average when you double CO2 in the atmosphere. The GIS models are known to be a little bit more sensitive than others, and uh, the NCAR models are a little bit more conservative. So we're using a conservative model here. Our setup is as follows. We simulate the, the pre-industrial area by just um, imagining a total solar irradiance decrease as, as reconstructed by Judith Lean. Um, and then we have pre-industrial CO2 and then other uh, greenhouse gases, about 288 parts per square million, per, uh, parts per million. Um, and then we imagine the B1 scenario where we have 550 parts per million and we let the model spin up. And what you do is you, you take a per you take the model, you, you take a perpetual season or perpetual month, and you just run it until it equi equilibrates. And then once it's stable, that's where you download the data from the model. And um, what we find, just in terms of what happens to the surface air temperature, um, in the pre-industrial conditions, where we're looking at, say, 1780 versus 1650 or so, um, you know, the Maunder minimum induces, the, the historical Maunder minimum induced a th about a th 0.35 uh, degree cooling on, in the global average. Um, that's consistent with proxy data records and, uh, and past simulations. Uh, but there's a little bit more to the picture here. Now, the, the global temperature averages are a convenient number, but they don't always tell the whole story. Um, in fact, sometimes they, they're just, they, they gloss over too many things. Uh, the Earth's climate system is quite complicated, and, and the radiative effects of the greenhouse effect and solar, uh, solar irradiance interact with atmospheric circulation and uh, 
and cause you know, bring about all kinds of interesting phenomena. All kinds of there are all kinds of modes of variability in the in the real climate system. One of the major ones in the northern hemisphere is uh, the North Atlantic Oscillation, also sometimes known as the Arctic Oscillation. And um, basically, that, that's a an oscillation. Is, it's measured as a seesaw in in, um, in surface pressure, in sea level pressure between latitudes around the Azores and latitudes around Iceland. And um, when the uh, when you have strong low pressure in, at higher latitudes, that allows the westerlies and the storm tracks to become stronger and condense toward the pole, and that allows warmer air to advect into higher latitudes. Um, and the opposite is true when, when the, uh, the low pressure is not so pronounced at, at, in the Arctic. Um, and it turns out that as the climate warms, if you, if you induce a change in the, uh, the stratosphere versus temperature, or stratosphere versus troposphere temperature gradient, you change the way uh, planetary waves are refracted, you change the, uh, the energy transport between lower latitudes and the pole such that you, you sort of force the climate system into a, uh, a strong northern Ant Arctic oscillation index and uh, you, you bring about a, a condensing of these westerlies toward the pole and allow warmer air to advect into higher latitudes. And so that's kind of a feedback mechanism on the, uh, the radiative warming itself. And uh, how that manifests in our simulation here, when we decrease the solar irradiance, we're actually doing kind of the opposite. We're, we're kicking the, uh, the northern annular, uh, the uh, North Atlantic Oscillation into a, uh, into a low index, and that is uh, affecting regional climate, um, such that we have warming in, uh, north in, in northern Alaska, um, and in eastern, in western Greenland and other parts of, of Asia. We also noticed in our simulation that um, the um, there's a sea ice albedo feedback as we cool the climate. There's more sea ice, and that uh, that amplifies the cooling effect a little bit. And I won't go that into that in too much detail. Um, it turns out when we um, okay, this is just uh, this is the sea ice feedback illustrated here, but suppose we go into our, our B1 scenario with our, uh, our nearly doubled greenhouse gases. We find that the, uh, the Maunder minimum, if it does occur, it really doesn't offset. You know, there's a slight, slightly smaller cooling, but it does, the, the Maunder minimum is not going to be strong enough to offset the, the warming caused by the CO2. Um, another interesting thing we note, if we compare our B1 scenario, our future Maunder minimum, to the pre-industrial Maunder minimum, uh, we find that regional warmings are actually stronger in the, um, in the uh, B1 scenario when you decrease the solar radiance. It's kind of a counterintuitive result, but again, it goes back to this North Atlantic Oscillation. Um, the, the, the change of the North Atlantic Oscillation becomes even stronger, and you get regional warmings that are stronger than they would have been if you hadn't decreased the solar radiance. So our conclusions from this part of the, uh, the program so far, um, the basically, the, the, the Maunder minimum occurring in the, in the future, say 50 years from now, would not offset the climate warming we're already, we're already bringing about. Um, in fact, regional, regional air temperatures, as we just saw, can, can actually get warmer when you decrease the solar radiance because of changing circulation related to the North Atlantic, os uh, the North Atlantic Oscillation. Um, um, one thing we noticed in our simulation, just consistent with historical records, uh, the model does reproduce a freezing of the Baltic, um, so we were happy to see that. So let's move on to the, um, the, the astrophysical perspective. How can we look for Maunder minimum-like uh, analogs uh, in, 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 nearby so in nearby stars? Um, Probably all, many of you are familiar with uh, the HK fluxes, the uh, you know the stellar magnetic activity heating the corona, um, sometimes uh, causing which sometimes brings about a core reversal if there's enough magnetic uh, activity, a core reversal in these in these what are normally absorption features in the uh, ultraviolet, on the uh, uh, due to the calcium. These are very lo very broad features, um, but the core reversal in these features can be strong enough that. Uh, even with, uh, say, two or three angstroms of resolution, you can measure a core reversal. And uh, there are various ways to quantify that. Um, the first people to do it were at Mount Wilson, where they devised a, a fairly simple spectrometer 
uh, that measured the, the, flux in the, the flux across the entire band and then a, with a small triangular band pass of about two or three angstroms in the middle of the band. And they just did simple ratios of those in both the H and K lines and they came up with what they called an S value. Um, those are still sometimes used today. Uh, others, um, it, it's more common now to actually express the, this uh, core reversal in terms of the flux in the core ratio to the entire solar luminosity and that's what we call a log R of HK. More commonly you'll see uh, log of R of HK than uh, going back to the, to the 1960s there were measurements of, um, of, this, of the activity uh, long enough that we can get cyclic information out of them and uh, most stars have some sort of cycle in their activity analogous to a <coughs> solar cycle but occasionally you find a star that the activity is flat, not only is the activity flat, but the actual uh, flux in the core of the sea of the calcium lines is quite low relative to other stars. And the question is, um, are these stars examples of, uh, of mandra minima in nature, in stars other than our sun? And I, I put a question mark here because uh, the answer is not always yes, as we see. Um, so the most intriguing of these uh, was observed at Lowell Observatory, uh, where they tracked a star that was flat for a while and then has begun cycling again. And so this, I think, is the, probably the, the biggest, uh, or the best identification of a monument so far in a nearby star, this, this particular one. Um, the, prob the problem is for us that these kind of, these multi-decadal surveys of, of, of chromospheric activity are quite rare. They basically encompass only a few hundred stars. There are a couple of programs, maybe, maybe three or four around the world that are committed to a certain target list, and they just keep monitoring the stars one year after another. Um, so you hope that they've chosen the right stars to look at. Um, however, instantaneous measurements uh, of stellar activity are available just, you know, in all kinds of spectroscopic data from planet searches and, and whatever, you know, thousands and thousands of stars. The chromospheric activity is measured in the calcium core reversals is very low. Instantaneously, is that an is that an indicator of a potential Maunder minimum state? Um, and does this provide insight as to how often the Maunder minimum occurs in nature? And is that an, an, is that an analog of uh, the percentage of the sun's lifetime spent in the Maunder minimum? Initially, um, when they first started looking at these surveys, uh, the answer was they, they began to publish was surprisingly large. Uh, this histogram here, published way back in 1990, just shows the, uh, the st on the x-axis the, uh, the chromospheric activity and these older s values just as a histogram. And you notice there's kind of a bimodal distribution with some very low activity comprising about 30 percent of the sample. And so these authors claimed that maybe the sun is in a Maunder minimum state 30 percent of its lifetime on the main sequence. And that would, that would indicate that solar variability is quite huge on century-like time scales. Um, but I think they, they ultimately overstated their case a little bit. Um, you're probably familiar with the Hipparchos satellite, the European Astrometric uh, mission, which surveyed something like 100,000 field stars. Um, from those very accurate distance measurements, we can ascertain whether a star is really on the main sequence or not. And uh, Jason Wright uh, at Berkeley went through this exercise with, uh, with Hipparchos data and derived a a theoretical or, or an empirical main sequence uh, from the Hipparchos parallaxes and then decided, then to, decided to look at these Maunder minimum candidates that uh, previous authors had identified and see if they really are on the main sequence. Um, if they're not on the main sequence, if they're evolved, they're not an analogous to Maunder minimum stars. And uh, wh what Jason Wright found was that uh, most of the stars people were claiming as Maunder minimum candidates are actually just evolved. Um, their low activity is just because they're just they're very old, they're evolved off the main sequence, something else is going on um, with their internal physics that's not like, a, uh, not like a main sequence star, so you can't consider them analogs of the Maunder minimum. Uh, a few did remain, and uh, in his paper he discusses some of these. Some of these stars, which are indicated by the boxes there, do have flat activity curves. They have been looked at over a decade or two. Um, but basically, when you go through and use the Hipparchos data to, realistic, to, to rigorously determine whether a star is on the main sequence or not, most of the Maunder minimum candidates go away. And, and that would suggest that the frequency of Maunder minima in nature is quite small, much smaller than initially predicted. So then some of these remain, but what 
how do we explain that? You know, activity, chromospheric activity um, is also related to just to age. As a star ages, its rotation slows, it generally becomes less and less active. So could that be an explanation? Are these, suns, are these stars just very old? Uh, so we need another mar marker of age. Uh, an, a, a fairly good one, at least for this purpose, is lithium abundance. Um, originally, when people started measuring lithium abundance back in the 60s, they thought that um, it could be a, uh, as good an indicator of age as, as activity or other measures, but it turns out there's a lot of spread in lithium abundance caused by planets. But no, nevertheless, lithium, it, it's not made in the star, it's just depleted uh, by convection. For solar types, so stars about the, within the temperature range of the sun, it's just made, it, it's just depleted by convection. Um, and so it should, its abundance should decrease fairly steadily uh, across the lifetime of a star, and that there is a lot of variability due to the presence of planetary systems. But generally speaking, um, if we find that there's low lithium abundance in these stars, that's probably a, uh, th then that's probably a better explanation for their, their low activity. Their, their ages, or advanced age is a better explanation for their low activity than, the, um, than them being in some instantaneous monitor minimum state. So we, uh, we started looking at lithium abundance, and it's, lithium has been measured in stars for various purposes for two or three decades now, and we just began just compiling lithium measurements from the literature. We've started going to Lick Observatory and, and making our own measurements as well to supplement this database. And we basically cross-referenced lithium measurements um, with, uh, with chromospheric activity measurements from the various planetar uh, planetary search catalogs. Um, here's just a survey of our whole sample, and then when we've um, identified only the ones that are on the main sequence, uh, we, we see a little bit more uh, in intelligible behavior on the right. As you go to, um, to hotter and hotter stars, you begin to see the lithium abundance drop off toward the, you know, the F-type stars, and that's well known. That's the, uh, the, the, it's called the lithium gap. There's something different in their astrophysics as opposed to solar-type stars. Um, lithium generally de decreases uh, as you go to cooler and cooler stars because cooler stars have deeper and deeper convection zones, which burns up the lithium more readily. So that's, the, that's the kind of the general pattern we, we expect to see in plotting lithium versus, uh, versus the uh, B minus V index or, or the, the temperature. When we isolate these stars that have uh, very low activity and compare them to the, to the mean for their, their color index range, we find that most of these stars have considerably lower lithium. Um, most of them, uh, actually half of, about half of them, more than one standard deviation uh, below the sample mean for their color index. Um, so what we conclude from this is that advanced age is probably a better explanation for these low activity stars. They're just, they're just old, they're nearly the end of their main sequence lifetime, they've kind of spun down. Um, they're probably not in some transient minimum um, like our own sun's maunder minimum. Um, on the other hand, we do find a few that have relatively normal lithium abundance and we think that those might be worth looking at with longer time series measurements to see if they really are maunder minima. So, Kind of wrapping up things here, uh, it's, it's kind of a short talk as is the, as we just began, we just, we just started this, this research program, but uh, we, we, we can start to answer some questions here. Uh, from our climate modeling and, and that done by others, um, I think we were among the first to, to actually look at future scenarios. A future monitor minimum, say 30, 50 years from now, does not offset the, the anthropogenic climate warming that we're, uh, that we're experiencing right now. There's a little bit of a cooling, but uh, at the same time, because of uh, things like the changes in North Atlantic Oscillation, you are going to see regional warming even um, when you decrease the solar radiance if the sun were to go into a monitor minimum. Um, at the same time, when we actually combine activity, uh, main sequence identification with Hipparchos and lithium abundance, uh, this suggests that the, the actual frequency of uh, the monitor minimum is not that great, maybe 5%, some, maybe 5% of the sun's lifetime is spent in the monitor minimum. And what I was hoping to start doing here uh, at, at SETI was uh, looking at the Kepler data. I mean, the Kepler photometry should be you know, wonderful over several years to, to identify uh, a stellar variability that might be analogous to flat, to flat activity. And maybe there's some monitor minimum candidates that might emerge in the Kepler data. Um, so that's where we're at right now. Um, as I said, we've just started this, but it's exciting. We, uh, we get to, uh, you know, you know, to, to observe with telescopes and, and do, uh, do climate research as well. Um, I guess I'll stop here and answer any questions. <laughs>
So, Dan, I have uh, one as um, someone who has a little bit of a bias here. Uh, you have shown the north, uh, northern hemisphere, but yeah. what, what's happening in the southern hemisphere? <laughs> okay. Um, I guess the, <laughs> the probably the northern hemisphere is where more climate research, where researchers are, um, and that's where a lot of the historical records, you know, from Europe, um, are, uh, are available. Um, there's just also just a, a lot more landmass in the northern hemisphere where some of these these data are um, are more easy to, to access. Uh, I think when you look at things like corals, there may be a preference for the um, for the sun southern hemisphere in the proxy records. There are a lot more reefs in the equator and, and south um, that can be studied. The corals um, they they will entrain heavier isotopes in, in cooler temperatures, so they are a sensitive measure of, of this kind of climate of this kind of, kind of temperature change. Um, but yeah, you're right, there is a bias toward the northern hemisphere just to what people have been doing. But your GCM modeling does uh, encompass the whole globe. You're oh, just yeah, pulling out the northern hemisphere results. In, in fact, I think in, in, our, in our actual, in our paper, we did include some southern hemisphere results as well. Um. Um, it, it's easy to think of the minimum as kind of a separate state in a in the physical system in some sense. But another picture is it's random variation and um, you just identify it as a low point. What, what's the thing on that? Is it really a multiple state system or is it a r random uh, variation? The people who are looking at that, uh, looking at the proxy records and also trying to model the you know, model this, the solar dynamo, they're the people on either side. And some people see cycles, some people see kind of a stochastic process that's, that's totally up in the air right now. Okay, well, cycles is a little different. I, I mean, yeah. um, that, that's, that's obviously another question that even stock market people talk about. Yeah. But um, multiple state, it, it has a definite physical meaning. But it, while it's in the minimum, it, 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 certain conditions on the sun or something are, are in an equilibrium, and then it moves out of that state. It, do people think in terms of that? Yeah, that's, that's how they're looking at it. Um, Uh, I, th I thought that also part of the uh, effect of the solar cycle was, in fact, a true change of the radius of the uh, effect of radiating the area of the sun. And that uh, doing solar maxima, for example, you can think of the sun's radius as having slightly increased in terms of effect of ra the effect of radiating area, the effect of photospheric radius has right. very, very slightly changed. So that... Uh, when you, when you look at these, these records, one thing that always struck me about what I read about them is that they were all centered in Europe. And everything was going on in Europe. And I say, fine, but I mean, Europe's affected by the Gulf Stream. And if the Gulf Stream had some glitch in it that lasted, let's say, 75 years, it would seriously affect the climate of Europe. Whereas for the rest of the world, you might not notice so much. I mean, have and, and that always seemed to be a weakness in this, in, you know, even though the correlation seems reasonable enough, this always seemed to be a big weakness such that everything was coming from not only Europe, but Northwest Europe, because that's where all the good records were. Well, it's, it's, it's a brand new area. I think um, that's, that's where we have to, to start. Um, what we're doing is we're, we're using climate models, uh, validating them against Europe, which, which, with which we can then study the entire world. And we do that a little bit in, in the paper that we published in GRL. Um, generally, the, the, our normal solar, to go back to your first, the first part of your question, the normal 11-year uh, solar cycle does bring about a total change in solar irradiance, uh, very small, you know, mm -hmm. tenths of a watt per square meter. However, that is large, much larger in the ultraviolet. And there are, have been studies that, you know, that show that that impacts stratospheric chemistry, which then can have some feedbacks to, climate, to the climate system. Um, so a lot, of this is, a lot of this is brand new. Um, yeah, because I'd always heard just by reading popular literature, not necessarily scientific, saying that, for example, when people look for evidence of the Maunder minimum in tree rings in California, where you have a lot of trees that last a long time, they had very great difficulty finding any great effects. I mean, during the Maunder minimum, the tree ring evidence seemed to show that the climate was slightly drier. It was drier, certainly, and maybe a little cooler, but nothing dramatic. Or at least that was the claim, you know, that 
Now, this is not a scientific paper, so right. it's, it's always hard to judge things you read in popular press versus scientific literature. But, I mean, I, I just kept thinking that all this stuff was going on in, in Northern Europe and uh, mm -hmm. uh, where, you know, I mean, I, I know, for example, that in Europe, if you have a, a low pressure area in just the right place so that the wind no longer blows from the northwest in the winter, you can have a very cold winter. You can have a big cold snap yeah. just by changing the fact that the, the winds are no longer, no longer blowing over the Gulf Stream. For example, I mean, it can last for a few weeks or something, and you know, you get a big cold snap. Well, like I said, you know, every, every time you look for some proxy data that's, that should be common to, you know, it should be valid no matter what region you study, uh, such as tree greens in California, that, that's a data point with, uh, with which we want to investigate the Maunder minimum. Um, I think the, the, the general take, one of the general takeaways from my talk is that um, it's, it's not just about the global average temperature, it's the regional climate variability. And so if, if you were to find a data set uh, showing something you know, surprising in, say, California or Australia or wherever, um, that's a regional climate pot pattern we have to explain somehow. And, um, and you just have to be open-minded about doing that. I mean, I think we, right now we use Europe as just the backstop because we have some, some data to at least calibrate the model or, or, or validate the model against, not calibrate it, but validate the model against. The uh, largest CO2 drop in the law dome record uh, starts about 1580, ends about 1610, has a magnitude of about t 10 parts per million, and there's about 20 years slop in the, those dates because of uncertainty in uh, lock in depth within the core. Uh, do you include this in the model and do you think it matters? Uh, we haven't gone back that, that's, you're going back to the sporer minimum then. We, we haven't gone back that far yet. Um, uh, so. uh, so 1580 to 1610, but with a 20 year uncertainty okay. in, when it, in, in, the, in the dates. Um, but we, we haven't gone quite back that far okay. yet, but it's something we, we probably should try. Um, so we've got uh, TSI and uh, magnetic activity. Are there any aspects of the spectrum that are, or do all the aspects of the spectrum pretty much line up when they all go up, they all go down, or, or is there some difference in it that might have different effects? Um, well, generally, it, solar variability is much more pronounced when you get to shorter and shorter wavelengths. In the ultraviolet, uh, especially the, the hard ultraviolet like UVB and UVC, uh, a few, a couple watts per square meter, a, a tiny percentage in the total solar radiance is many percent um, in the UV. Um, that's going to impact terrestrial climate through the, primarily through the stratosphere, uh, through stratospheric photochemistry, you know, ozone and, and related processes. And there have been studies that, sh that sh do show an impact. Um, so that's kind of indirect, an indirect effect of UV solar forcing as opposed to radiative forcing of the climate system. Do any of them go and uh, climate deniers sometimes say, oh, you're measuring TSI, but there's other stuff. I don't mm -hmm. know what it is, ether, whatever. But yeah. do any of these uh, um, outputs go in the opposite direction at all, or is it just a matter of uh, how s they all follow together? It's just some more than others. Well, um, some, some of the more sophisticated climate models, uh, the, NASA, the NASA Goddard Institute models, for example, they're, they're well known for having a very robust stratosphere. And some of the, the more recent simulations by Drew Schindel and others, they have, a, they have stratospheric chemistry in their model. And so if there's something going on with UV radiation, it's represented in the model output. And then they're not finding yeah, anything on this topic that's different. So one point you made in your talk is that during the Maunder minimum period, uh, the Thames uh, froze over solid, as did the Baltic, and you said that the models uh, corroborate, you know, the Baltic freezing over. Just intuitively, I'm surprised that a relatively small difference in temperature, maybe half to one degree centigrade, could make the difference between completely open water and a sea that's frozen solid. Could you comment on that? Um, I don't think this, I don't think the entire Baltic was ever frozen solid. I think this, uh, the belts referred to some to some uh, terrain that was owned by Sweden and terrain that was owned by Denmark, and they were all fighting over River Island back then. You know, if you remember your, seven, your European history, the, the Swedes were the neighborhood bullies of the 17th century, and so there were all these islands they were always fighting about. It's large portions of, of coastal Baltic that, that were impacted, not the entire, you know, it's not like a snowball earth. Um, there are also 
at that point, yeah, going back to the robustness of the European records, you know, the Hanseatic League from the Middle Ages kept records of ice because that affected shipping. And there are a couple of really good papers that show that it, it's mostly coastal, you know, coastal areas uh, that, are, that are impacted in shallower water. So, so it is pretty much verified. Small temperature change can make a huge difference in yeah. uh, coastal freezing or not yeah. freezing. Yeah. I, I and river. Yeah. I, I don't think, you know, and, and of course, most shipping was coastal in those days, so that's what they were looking at. Sure. If we don't have any further questions, uh, Dan, as a uh, token of our gratitude for coming on and enlightening us on uh, something that might okay. be uh, down the road Perfect. in terms of climate change, is a uh, SETI pin. Okay, thank you. And if you'll all join me in thanking Dan for his talk.